Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. With me today is Melora Jackson. She is going to tell us about the virtual dementia tour, which I had the benefit of taking back in July of 2019. You remember those before times? And it's well worth doing again whenever we can all start meeting in person again, because virtual doesn't mean online, does it? (laughs) No, it doesn't. (laughs) Thank you for joining me. Why don't you tell us what your background is, and then we'll talk about the tour. Sure, sure. So um, I am the uh, virtual tour virtual dementia to our clinical manager with Second Wind Dreams. And um, right now I oversee um, all things related to dementia training for our organization, Second Wind Dreams. Uh, My background is gerontology, psychology, and um, with an emphasis in uh, dementia. Uh, And so um, we have a, a, a wide reach across the country and some international partners as well. So I work with folks all over the world doing the tour. Yeah. Well, that's awesome because it is it is a very I'm not sure eye opening is the right word, but it is a very informative thing to do so that you can better understand some of the things that are are your loved one, our loved ones are going through. So since it's not an online tour, why don't you describe it for the listeners who have not had the benefit of taking the tour? Sure. What what do, how do we how do we, how, how does this work? <laughs> how does this work? So the virtual dementia tour um, is a, I was the brainchild of PK Bevel, who uh, first created it as a uh, thesis project uh, in her grad, graduate school work back in 2001. Um, and it was designed at the time just simply to be a, a simulation of what it might be like to have dementia. And it grew from there. Um, And so that's truly still what it is. It's a simulation of what it's like to have dementia so that uh, we can uh, become more empathetic and understanding of what it's like for folks who have uh, dementia and be able to relate to them better, to communicate better with folks, um, to be able to provide better care. Um, So uh, the word virtual she came up with that at the time was before we had virtual reality, uh, before we really did much. I mean, we had the internet, but we didn't do a lot of, there wasn't, VR wasn't a thing then. Um, and so in this case, virtual means actually, means real. Um, so um, it was virtually like having dementia. So what we do in the virtual dementia tour is we garb people up with um, various equipment to simulate um, the effects that dementia has on the brain. So um, we uh, alter most of the senses. Uh, We give people some things to do and put them in a room uh, with some, some, uh, and I don't want to give away too much, but we we have, uh, we we dim the room and we put uh, some task items and a lot of other things in the room. And and the person has to negotiate that environment. Uh, for a limited amount of time. And then we bring them out before and after we ask people questions about their attitudes about dementia and what they think it's like. Um, and we see a, a dramatic difference uh, typically, um, no matter who's taking the tour, whether it's a family member, um, somebody from the general community, a, a somebody who takes care of people professionally with dementia. Um, so it does really kind of change people's um, view. And I, I would say actually for some, it is eye-opening. Um, uh, for others, it confirms things that they thought they knew. Um, so it just depends on, on the individual. But um, it is an evidence-based tool, which means we've done a lot of research on it. We continue to, to do research and have many outside entities, uh, universities, and so on, um, do research on aspects of it. So it's not just some sort of um, touchy-feely exercise. It's, this is grounded in science, um, and it meets federal criteria to be an evidence uh, scientific program. Um, so... It just takes a few minutes. Uh, it's followed by a discussion about what the person experienced um, and what what did it mean for them and how are they going to change their behavior towards people with dementia. So we try to to make sense of it all because um, it, it can be it can be confusing. Um, if you people are in the tour for a while, sometimes some of their behavior mimics the behavior of people with dementia. Um, so it's interesting for people to be able to draw those parallels between how they behaved and how they thought 
um, and what the people with dementia are experiencing and how they behave and how it helps normalize what it's like to have dementia quite a bit. Well, I can confirm that because it feels like a lot longer than a few minutes, trust me. Oh, yeah. So that's an interesting realization because I, you know, it's been what, two or three years now. And so, but I still, I still remember at one point just feeling like, this is ridiculous. I, why am I doing this? You know, and, and just kind of that feeling of forget it. I'm just not going to do it, which would be a typical attitude for my mom. So that, that was very helpful. I've, I've always, I frequently tell people I have weird vision, so I don't have depth perception and I don't, in, you know, in low light, it's like really hard to tell what is where in, in, in you know, in a relationship to me is like, is it close? Is it middle? Is it far? And ugh. And sometimes shadows, you know, like low contrast, just, it just messes with my brain. So I, I did have the benefit of, of that personal experience. Mm -hmm. I understood my mom's visual processing, not being great pretty well, but the tour was like I said, it was it was definitely helpful because I, I could feel some of the things she felt and which is obviously the point. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think, too, you know, I mean, obviously not everybody's going to have those visual issues, but it will give other people a chance to um, uh, experience the same things you're living with day to day. And you don't have to have dementia to have some of these visual issues. And some of the some of the aspects of it are, um, you know, elements of uh, things that happen to us that are sort of chronic aging issues and they're not in there because uh because dementia gives you those things but it's about how the pe person with dementia uh, loses the ability to adapt um, to do things to help themselves so for example if a person wears glasses and now they have dementia and they take keep taking their glasses off and leaving them places it's not you know we think oh, they've got dementia, they've got Alzheimer's, they've forgotten where they put their glasses. Well, maybe, but it may also be that they're not making the connection that if I put the glasses on, I'll be able to see better. Or if I turn on the light, I'll be able to see better or whatever. So yeah, so it's it can be helpful to um, people who don't have dementia, but ha are living with one particular issue, like, uh, like, like the vision issue that you you deal with. Um, and for other people to understand that, so you can get, get some empathy for people living with these other conditions as well as dementia. So. Fortunately for me, it's been this way my entire life. So it's not, it's not weird to me, mm -hmm. but occasionally it's obvious. Like, like I said, there was one night we were out cycling at twilight and it was like, holy crap, I can't figure out where, where I am in relationship to parked cars and shadows and, you know, and you're moving. So it's, like, it's a little scary. I don't generally oh, yeah. ride at twilight anymore just because it kind of gives, you know, my cycling glasses are prescription, but they're very dark sunglasses. So that would really not be a good help. But I, there was one time I was trying to light a birthday candle on the cake and my friend basically moved my hand so that it was touching the candle and not like somewhere randomly around the candle. And, you know, it was embarrassing, but, you know, it's just it's just the way it's been my entire life. So it's normal for me, but I, I am aware that I have this issue and, you know, those close to me are aware of it. And I'm really glad that, you know, cars come with um, you know, some of those safety things. Mm -hmm. So I don't tailgate people by accident anymore. <laughs> That was that was one of my biggest problems is sometimes like a car in front of me, they'd like pull over or they'd speed up and I'd be like, oh, crap, probably been tailgating them. Oops, sorry. Didn't mean to. It's just because I can't tell where they are. It's just I have to to feel it, I guess. It's weird. But yeah, it definitely helped with my mom and her visual processing because I could relate. And that's the whole point of the tour. So what types of. What what experiences have you learned about from people that have gone through the tour? I guess that's what I'm trying to say. It's been a morning already. <laughs> so, yeah. So we've had a variety of reactions, but most people um, have sort of that aha moment um, where they realize, oh, my gosh, um, I've been, um, for example, always... Um, getting frustrated with my mom for following me around or doing the same things that I do. Um, and yet 
here I was going through the tour and I didn't know what to do. So I kept following the other person around that I saw in the room thinking maybe they knew what to do. Um, or people often, you know, come out of there feeling, well, I think family caregivers particularly um, tend to feel a lot of guilt uh, because they think, oh my gosh, I've been doing all this wrong. But um, so one of the things that we talk about is the fact that, you know, we're not born knowing how to, to, to care for people with dementia. This isn't a normal part of aging. So it's not normal to have, uh, to know all the answers. So we sort of help people understand to forgive yourself for what you didn't know before. And now, now that we know what it's like, how are we going to change how we do things and give ourselves a little grace for that? Um, one of the things that we do, uh, in the after, right when people first come out, we ask them to fill out this little attitude survey. We always ask that question, what are you going to do differently? And the answers are usually things like, I'll be more patient. I'll, um, I will be more understanding. I will talk slower. Um, I will break tasks down one thing at a time. Um, you know, lots of things like that. So, so that learning is beginning before we even process what they just went through. They're already making those, those connections. And I think that's kind of universal, no matter who takes the tour. Um, so that's a very encouraging thing. But um, I think some of the other lessons that people get out of it besides adjusting um, their own feelings about it um, are just um, realizing that they need to be um, slower, as I said, slow down with people, take it one day at a time, take it one minute at a time sometimes if you're providing care. Um, and uh, I think also um, it's changed how people who work in the community and interact with people who um, are older adults or um, they who have cognitive issues, you know, whether it's in a in a, uh, a faith based organization or you know the bank or the shopping center or whatever, um, it it helps people in all of these sort of community venues to become a little more dementia friendly, and that you know that's real important too. So um, it's not just for people who provide care directly; it's really for anybody. Um, I always tell people, and I might be jumping ahead here, but I always say, you know, people are always asking me who should take this tour, and I always say. Um, if you've reached puberty, um, you don't have cognitive issues yourself. Um, it's not for people with dementia, certainly. Um, and you uh, breathe the air, <laughs> then you probably need to take the tour because you're going to interact with people with dementia at some point in your life in some venue, whether it's um, personally or professionally, probably both um, at some point. So anyway, so I think um, a lot of the reactions are... Um, are, are very positive. Um, it, some people are upset when they first come out, but they're glad they did it. Um, and uh, I think it one of the lessons that that we try to focus on at the end is not only what is it like for that person and and what are those deficits that we need to help we need to help that person with, but what are they still able to do and try to focus them on their strengths. But ultimately, you know, I've had many, many, many people say, this is really helping me to be able to relate, takes the fear out of talking to people with dementia, or um, they say things like, this is going to help me focus on the person more than the disease, which is really ultimately what we're going for, that person-centered care. So, um, so yeah, the reactions are overwhelmingly positive, but the lessons can vary from individual to individual, depending on what the, um, uh, what their circumstances are. When I went through it, it was, I was by myself, so I didn't even get the benefit of trying to shadow whoever else was struggling through the tour themselves. So that's an interesting difference, but have you given these tours to very many people in the medical profession? Cause I personally think that's one of the places we need to focus on. Oh, I could not agree more. Yes, absolutely. Of course, you know, it was designed originally for people working in long-term care, but um, we have since developed different um, different versions of, of the tour, and we try to reach out to, uh, we. it's over, in over 200 universities and colleges now. Most of those programs are um, either nursing schools or allied health, um, some medical schools. Um, we have a version now that we do specifically for hospital staff, um, a hospital version to be designed to be done in a hospital setting, because, you know, most people who... Um, who don't have a loved one with dementia, um, 
they think that if the person's medically trained, they're, you know, they're in healthcare, they surely they understand what it's like, but that's nothing could be further from the truth. Um, so they have, you know, people who work in the hospitals, that's not, that's not how they got, they didn't get trained for that. They got trained to take, to save lives and to take care of, of those physical needs. But um, so we do a lot of work now with different healthcare providers, both in the hospital setting and clinics and um, allied health fields, all that, the, the whole range. Yes. Cause it's desperately needed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I used to get so frustrated at the last year of my mom's life, we ended up going to the doctor far too regularly for, suspected UTIs, I finally got smart and realized that understandably and correctly, the care staff in the community she lived in, they would sound the alarm almost prematurely. And an emphasis on almost. I have no complaints over their care. They, they did a great job with my mom. But I learned that if I waited a day or two and she didn't get worse, then we didn't need to go. Because going her doctor literally was down the hill from my house. So I'd have to like drive, you know, 10 miles to go get her, then come all the way back to my house past it plus a mile, you know, and it, I swear, and it, I don't know what it was I did because I tried to always be upbeat and positive and not let on we were going to the doctor. Because as soon as she realized where we were going, it was, you know, full negative reverse thrusters. I'm not doing this. I don't need to be here. And we'd, we'd go into the doctor's office and they'd be, they'd literally hand me the plastic cup and say, oh, okay, can you get a urine sample from, no, we've been through this multiple times, people. Why, like put the freaking, you know, note on the top of the chart. I don't care. You know, we, I shouldn't have to explain to you how we do this every time. It's not, not my job. I brought her here. You people need to do your job. And it just. That frustration that of course translated to her and it just, you know, it just it just multiplied. And, you know, the staff, they were all, you know, they were nice people. You know, they never acted while well, they only acted nasty when I got frustrated with them, but you know, they, they were trying to do their job, but it just, it, oh, it was so frustrating that they, they couldn't, you know, it was like, can't you open her chart and read advanced Alzheimer's and remember, oh yes, we have to put the thing in the toilet for her to urinate in. We can't do the whole cup, you know, I'm like, no, it's like, why is this always a thing? So, yeah, I really wish her doctor's office had participated in this tour because if it didn't help them understand her, which I know it would have, it would have maybe helped them understand the position I was in, like all the family caregivers like myself that are, you know, basically caught between their loved one and a, you know, a medical system that has no clue with Alzheimer's and really wondering when that's going to change. <laughs> we need, we need desperately to have a lot more mental health training, not just cognitive mm -hmm. impairment training. Mm -hmm. So you said this is a, like a federally, not federally backed, but it's, um, I forgot the term now. Sorry. My, my brain's all, only working halfway this morning, apparently, but it's, it's, uh, you're gathering evidence and data. Yeah, what are we doing? Yeah. Go ahead. You, you can fill in the gaps that I'm desperately searching <laughs> sure, for. Sure. So it's, it's an evidence-based um, program and evidence-based training. So what that means is when I say federal criteria, there's certain criteria um, uh, for funding. Uh, for example, we have um, some federal grants uh, to provide it to nursing homes in specific states um, and uh, through CMS. And it has to meet those criteria. Um, and so those criteria say that uh, that it's pr not only proven, but it, it that it has um, some some hard scientific, you know, valid research behind it. Um, and uh, so we have oodles of research that's been done over the years and um, some new exciting research that I know some universities around, not just in, in the U.S., but in some other countries as well are doing. Um, on different aspects of it. So some of it's about how do we improve it, make it more effective. And some of it's on what is the after effect? How does it, does it really change the behavior of the, the person who takes it um, in the long term? Um, you know, is it just a, oh, well, that was nice. And I'm going to change the way I do this. I'm going to be more patient and then leave and nothing changes. No, we, we, we've tracked folks. And um, one of the things we do actually in our grants that supports that evidence base is um, we have another tool called DACE, which is called, it's a, 
it's a tool to measure person-centered care, which, um, you know, we all, you know, you hear that term person-centered care. And you're like, well, yeah, I know it when I see it, you know, good person-centered care is focused on that individual, right? But how do we define it? If you said define it for me, it's kind of, you know, well, it's, you know, it's hard to just make it tangible. So that's what DACE does. It's an assessment tool designed to measure behaviors of those providing care and track their behavior changes over time. So we typically do that beforehand. Uh, we have somebody who uh, watches the staff and, and, and rates them on these scales. Um, and then we take them through the tour. And then a couple of weeks later, do the days again to see are it, have their has their behavior changed and then about nine months later take the tour again and do it do a days a third time and what we found in in our grant projects um, is that we can sustain quite a bit of change in that person's uh, behavior towards those with dementia um, so there's value number one in taking the tour more than once but also um, that it really is an effective uh, tool. So um, that's, and of course, that's, that's the whole point is to change our behavior. We can't rely on that person with dementia to change. That's not, that's no longer their responsibility. Um, and I always say, you know, people with dementia don't behave badly. Um, the disease does sometimes, but they don't, um, their condition behaves badly. So that's something that's really helpful, I think, for those in the trenches who are dealing with that. Um, but but so we have um, some good hard data that says, yes, we can change behavior, which means we can do a better job of taking care of people with dementia. And that that changes lives right there, which is really exciting. But um, so that's when we say evidence based, that's what we're talking about. And so you you could run a lot of people through this tour in, say, an eight hour work day. Oh my gosh. Yes. Yeah. Um, you can take, uh, and we have different ways of doing it. We can do it group style where everyone's there the whole time or people come and go and have their time slot, um, whatever works. Um, but we typically, um, can do a train, a, a tour with, you know, you take lunch and breaks and you can still get an average of 75, 80 people through in a day. So yeah. And you know, it just, it varies. If you need to do more people, you just set up two rooms and have a few extra helpers. And you can double the amount of people. So, yeah, we can do it for a lot of folks or just a few people, whatever the need is. It's very flexible. Well, it also, this is my entrepreneur side thinking and talking here, is it's a very cost effective way to help people to train them, essentially, mm -hmm. because it's, you know, five, well, let's say it's 20 minutes a person, five minutes before, five minutes after, five or 10 minutes or Five minutes before to answer the questions, five or so minutes in the tour and five or 10 minutes afterwards to answer questions. And in that, say, 20 minutes, they are, they, I don't want, maybe not profoundly changed, but they're definitely changed. You can't mm -hmm. go through this tour and not be changed. Yeah. I mean, unless you're, I can't imagine that you wouldn't be changed because <laughs> I've done it. So I know what it's like. And, you know, I know cost is a factor for lots of, you know, care homes and, you know, just everybody cares about the bottom line because that's just the way we, we are in this country. And I think that's a, you know, and it's not a sit and be lectured at and look at PowerPoint slides. And cause that stuff drives me bananas after a while. I just <laughs> zonk out. Not my, it's not my ideal way of learning things. I like to learn by doing yeah. is so is, I guess I I guess that really wasn't a question. It was more of a, an observation that it's an excellent cost-effective way to train a lot of people in a short period of time. I mean, what else? Can, I mean, yeah. Yeah. that sounds it's like the perfect is. scenario. It is. Yeah. It's, it really is kind of a win-win because, and uh, I completely agree with you. Um, I think, uh, well, I know that the most effective learning for adults is simulation learning, um, doing things is much more effective than lecture. I mean, I always talk about death by PowerPoint. You know, we've all been through those lectures and presentations. And it's not that they're not of value in this, you know, there's some good stuff, but if you expect people to retain it, especially people who are in, who are, you know, actually providing care, direct care workers or family members, or, uh, you know, whoever, um, they really need to, to go through the motions. And once we walk in someone else's shoes, 
you know, we can do a better job, you know, and, you know, it's just like anything. I mean, if you're, you're learning how to be a cook at a restaurant, we don't just give you a manual and say, learn the recipes and then expect that, you know, you do on the job training. So this is sort of, you know, we're not doing on the job training, but we're starting the, 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 the experience of what it's actually like. So, yeah, so it is fairly cost-effective um, if um, an organization wants to get the program because they can use it over and over. They can use it in a lot of different ways. They can use it for onboarding. They can use it um, when they see it and uh, a particular issue for an employee. They can, you know, pull it back out and they can focus their talking points afterwards. But, you know, and for the person taking the tour, no matter what kind of, of setting it is, the participants never pay, you know? So if somebody's hosting it for the community, those people coming to take the tour never pay for it. We don't want that. But um, the best thing about the, the we call it VDT for short, because it's a mouthful otherwise, say it over and over. Um, the, the VDT is the good basic sort of platform base uh, for training. So what I mean by that is if, if you, go through the tour, now you do have a bit of a change in your, your attitude, whether it's big or small, everybody has some um, uh, learning and, and effect on everybody. Um, and then your eyes are more open and you're more interested in anything someone has to tell you about dementia now. So that is another big benefit for folks is that they, they they take the tour and now they're going to pay attention to that 20 minute in service later on, on, on um, better ways to help the person eat at mealtime or, you know, b- better bathing, you know, whatever the, the particular training is on. If it's related to dementia, they're going to be more interested because they've walked in those shoes. So yeah, there's definitely, definitely a lot of benefit there. So. Well, obviously you probably haven't, conducted many of these tours in the last year or so because of COVID? Well, not as many. We've had a few. Um, we've got some safety measures that we built in um, that for our uh, the people who conduct it for us, our trainers. Um, and But we certainly want people to be comfortable with it. Um, we've done more um, uh, more social distancing ways of doing it um, and having the individual garb themselves. Uh, we've had to make some alterations and change some of the things. So, but it is kind of a close contact sport. It's kind of hard to do um, uh, uh, well. And you, you have to do it in person. So um, it, it was a bit of a challenge uh, for a while. Everything stopped. So we're slowly beginning to get more and more uh, folks doing it. And, you know, some places um, require, you know, everyone wears the masks and gloves. Some places You know, you have to have a vaccine. It's entirely up to the the person providing it, how they want to structure that. Um, But yeah, it's, it's starting, we're starting to get back at it. So like everything else. Yeah. We did a hard stop there for a while. uh, (laughs) Definitely. Like like the whole world did. (laughs) Yeah. So (laughs) no, go ahead. (laughs) No, that, that was basically what I was going to say. Okay. I took it at an event that Tipa Snow was at and it was sponsored by a local, well, the, I guess it was the parent company of a local assisted living memory care community. How would somebody like a family caregiver, how would they find out if hopefully, you know, 2022, you'll be all, you'll be all over the place again, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Making up for lost time. Is there a way for family caregivers to learn where you may be at? Cause the, the tour mm-hmm. was sort of an added bonus on top of TIPA, on top of lunch, not necessarily mm-hmm. in that order of priority. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah. not everybody that was at the, you know, her talk took the tour, which was kind of unfortunate. I think some people were a little, a little bit afraid. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure why. Maybe you know, I'm trying to remember it. We're talking over two years ago now. I'm trying to remember how they worded it. but. I I knew it was important for me, for what I do, and for my mom. So how would a family caregiver find out if one of these VDTs is coming somewhat close to them in the near future, hopefully 22 or 23? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of ways. Uh, First of all, they can get in touch with us. Um, They can go to our website, um, which is secondwind.org, or call us um, and, and ask and we can look up who is in the area closest to them who has the program. A lot of different um, 
assisted livings, nursing homes, personal care homes, home health, hospices. Um, sometimes elder law attorneys have it. Um, not a, not a, a group you'd think of, but it's very effective for them as well. Um, lots of other entities ha have uh, a license to use the program um, and will offer public tours. Um, and so then we'll connect them with, with an organization close to them that offers them uh, in the community and we'll, we'll, we'll hook them up. The other option is, um, uh, and we also try to post when we hear about them, we post on our website. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of folks don't, don't let us know. So it's limited. So if you get on there and you see only like one or two things and they're not anywhere near the state you live in, that doesn't mean it's not happening. It just means that nobody told us. Uh, so we throw up what we can, um, but we also have a Facebook page. We try to uh, to to put uh, notices there when we hear about it. Uh, but we also have a family version um, that uh, people can purchase. That's a self directed version, and it comes with a book, a little little caregiver manual. It's not as ideal as as going through it and having a professional talk with you, but it's but it helps. So uh, that's available um, at our website too. Um, so we've got a couple of different options, but I think the best is for, for people who just want to experience it for the first time um, to just get in touch with us and we will find somebody local to them who's doing it and we'll, we'll get that arranged. So we definitely want as many people as possible to take this tour and we want to make it as easy as possible for them to do it. So that would be my recommendation, definitely. Well, I have a thought because I am a Rotarian, I'm a third generation Rotarian, which is a service organization. Don't know if you're familiar with Rotary. Yes. Oh, awesome. I think this is something Rotary clubs should do for their members and invite. So a member slash community service project. Oh, I'm going to have yeah. to think on that one. I am awesome. currently have been asked by my club, which is unfortunately going to change the end of 2021 here because we're like i said we're moving is to write up i don't know if manual is the right term so that's that sounds lengthier than it's going to be basically a tips pamphlet maybe on how clubs can deal with members with alzheimer's or some other form of dementia because my club is dealing with that and they're lucky because they have me to guide them and help and Obviously, this is going to be a problem for more, you know, all all organizations, you know, commercial, you know, retail, restaurants, everything. Every you know, at some point, somebody's going to have an issue because they're they don't know how to, they don't understand what they're dealing with for mm -hmm. starters, and then they don't know how to properly handle it. So, yeah, I I only I have too many ideas and not enough time. <laughs> I think it's a brilliant idea, but yeah, in, in terms of incorporating this, <clears throat> yeah, have your clubs call us, you know, any civic organization or faith-based faith uh, organization that wants to have, you know, they may not want to get the program themselves, but they can host it. They can get in touch with us and we'll link them up with someone who can come and, you know, set it up and you'd be the host, you know, or whatever. There's, there's so many ways to do it. So that would be a, a great, a great project though. Definitely. Well, that sounds like a perfect tie-in with this this tip thing or whatever. I don't know what we were calling it, but <laughs> this little flyer or pamphlet or whatever that I'm I'm working on for our club, I am definitely going to share it. My husband does things on the district level, which is in our current district is 72 clubs. So even if we could get our district to roll this out and offer it to 72 clubs, that's a lot of clubs. Then we're we're basically northwest of san francisco all the way basically to the border to a little town called weed <laughs> which is a very tidy little town in northern california way up by oregon but no that now you're just giving me more things to do i'm gonna have to <laughs> i'm gonna have to hire myself a free assistant <laughs> is there anything else people should know about this tour or the 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 data that you're gathering other than I'm, I'm endorsing it because it's definitely an eye-opening experience. It's not scary. It might be a little frustrating, but it's short, mm -hmm. short lived. And it really will help you. If you, if you thought you understood what they were going through, it'll, it'll affirm it or 
change your mind. It's just, it's well worth spending 10, 15 minutes doing this tour. Yeah. But what else should people know from your side of the aisle here? I think, um, I think one, it's nothing to be afraid of. It, it can feel frustrating in there, but that's part of the point. But we, we'll take care of folks afterwards um, and make sure people understand everything and why it's done. And uh, so we don't leave people hanging, um, certainly. Um, secondly, um, I think it really does help change change everyone, uh, makes life better for everyone. Um, and um, I think the other thing to know about it is that um, the program itself, the Virtual Dementia Tour, was donated to our parent organization, Second Wind Dreams. And Second Wind Dreams' mission is to change the perception of aging. Um, and so we do that primarily through uh, fulfilling dreams of elders who live, usually the ones who live in long-term care, um, elder care communities who don't have anybody. Um, because we want people to understand that, um, you know, we have dreams and hopes no matter what our age is. And we don't stop being people just because we're old. We're still viable and, you know, important. So it's a way to create awareness. So all the funds, when people buy the virtual dementia program or um, uh, donate to it or whatever, all of that goes back to helping fulfill dreams. So so there's um, there's a, another good cause to add on to that, as well as um, the effectiveness of, of taking the tour um, itself. So um, we, we've we reached um, several million people so far, but uh, there's still some people on the planet we have to reach. So uh, uh, if you haven't taken the tour, definitely, definitely would encourage you to do that. Of course, yes, I am biased, but I think it really is effective. Um, it's it's a helpful tool. And um, uh, I think that uh, life can be so much better for everybody um, who has um, any kind of neurocognitive disorders and um, uh, we can all do our part. And, and I think taking the tour is one of the steps to doing that. Yeah, I agree. And until we find a prevention or a cure, we're just going to have more and more of us living with the disease or mm -hmm. helping somebody live with the disease. So it's even if you don't know anybody with Alzheimer's or some other form of dementia, it's very likely going forward that you're going to interact with somebody. It might be short interaction at the coffee shop, or it could be a member in your rotary organization that's <laughs> doesn't realize they have Alzheimer's. And mm -hmm. so they're causing some challenges. Absolutely. <laughs> that's kind of what's going on with my club. And, yeah. you know, we all want to be good stewards of life and we want to, we want to handle things well and appropriately. And we'd really like not to make a situation worse. So this is a definitely an easy, easy step. And it will stick with you because, like I said, mine was two, a little over two years ago, two and a half about this point. So and I, I, I remember it quite pretty, pretty vividly. Not that that was not that that's a negative thing, but it just that's how well it stuck with me. It didn't fade into the background of mm -hmm. of life with everything that's going on. So I appreciate this. And mm -hmm. Laura is going to be back soon. And we're going to be talking about dementia interpreters, which. That topic really excites me. <laughs> so we had to start with this one first today. I very much appreciate it. The website is definitely linked in the show notes. And once we get settled in our new place and we switch rotary districts, I will definitely be working with the my what I've been writing up and this and see if I can make some good stuff happen because I'm kind of feeling like that's a neat thing I should do. I think that'd be wonderful. Thank you. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.